This is Intelligence Matters, sponsored by Flare, a leader in providing actionable cyber threat intelligence to companies and governments around the world. Pedro Borelli is the founder and managing director of BNV Holdings, a financial advisory firm. He is also an expert on political and economic affairs in Latin America, particularly Venezuela. Pedro has been on our show before, and he joins us today to talk about the recent election in Venezuela. We will be right back with that discussion after a quick break. I'm Michael Morrell, and this is Intelligence Matters. The lines between geopolitical risk and cyber risk are blurring. Flare is a next-generation, continuous threat exposure management SaaS platform that equips corporate information security teams with world-class collection and continuous monitoring across dark web cybercrime forums, markets, telegram channels, and sources of geopolitical risk. Flare sets up in 30 minutes creates actionable intelligence from hour one, and is used by governments, security teams, and threat intelligence teams around the world. You can try Flare's free trial at their website, flare.io. That's flare.io. Pedro, welcome back to our show. It's great to have you again. Thank you very much, Michael. So Pedro, people should know that you and I and our families are very close friends. They should also know that you and I have had many long conversations about the world and certainly many conversations about Venezuela. And we're going to open up one of those conversations today to all of our listeners. So um, I think people are very lucky to hear you and we're very lucky to have you. Thank you, Michael. And I fully agree with your disclaimer. I could almost just repeat it back, uh, and I'm very happy to be back talking about a crisis that seems never to end. Yeah, yeah. Pedro, before we get into the recent election, which is going to be the focus of our conversation, I just want to remind everyone that Venezuela was at one time one of the most stable democracies and one of the richest economies in Latin America but not for the last 25 years, correct? Correct. Um, we had um, a long run, well, long run uh, considering Latin American. We had a 40-year run from 58, essentially to 98. And I'll be grateful to, to Mr. Chavez, and I would say that until 2001, things were, in a way, going uh, still democratic. I think things started twisting there. I think when one looks back to try to understand how we got into trouble, it is very clear that uh, the bountiful wealth that this country had because of oil, uh, once it fell 100% into the hands of the state in 1976, uh, it made the state too big. Um, we, we ended up with a society that's almost like a socialist society with a state in full control of the resources and therefore somewhat of the destiny of the country, the rest of the country looked minute, the private sector, the banking sector, it looked very small compared to the large state post-nationalization. And I think while we're very proud of that, um, that achieving full control of an industry that was formerly in the hands of foreign oil companies, we did not understand the damage it did for the political body, for the decision-making, for the nature of decision-making, for the quality of decision-making, until it got too late. And I think when it got too late, uh, it created an opportunity for a charismatic, populist, mediocre military guy to offer himself as an option, and um, and the rest is history. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we cre the conditions created, particularly in that year of the election '98. We, there was a massive uh, fall in the oil price, prompted somewhat by a price war between Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. We wanted to double our production from 3 million to 6 million. Two of those were coming to the U.S. The Saudis weren't that happy, and they challenged us to a price war, and prices collapsed in 98. The elections were at the end of the year, and that obviously created a great 
level of discontent that Chavez capitalized. So that's a little bit of a background as to what was a final ingredient. Uh, but you know, at the end, even that charisma that Chavez had, uh, you know, obviously didn't work until oil prices rose again from nine to 140. He became quite popular. Then he got sick. Then he died. Then the wrong guy came to power, and then oil prices fell. So I mean, it's, a, it's a, a sequence from which you know we haven't recovered. Almost from the time that Nicolas Maduro took over, oil prices declined, and then we could go deeper into who Nicolas Maduro was. But obviously, you know, he's been in power for 11 years, and the destruction that's happened in these 11 years has actually been obviously much faster than the destruction that occurred in Chavez's period. And we essentially have today an organized crime group, a narcotics trafficking group that also happens to run a country, correct? I think it's a first real case where you don't have a state that kind of looks to the other side or deals tangentially with criminal organizations. The state itself is a cartel. And this is a very new phenomenon. And as we try to discuss what's going on right now, let's keep this in mind. I always say that the worst, the worst remedy is a bad diagnosis. And I think almost from the beginning, when Hugo Chavez saw that Venezuela was a pass-through for drugs coming from Colombia, trying to go out through different ports in Venezuela, and that was handled by the National Guard, he, as an army guy, somehow decided, let's get the army into this. And, and suddenly it became bigger and bigger. Not just the job of the guard who's guarding the border, the highways, the ports, the airports, to get paid to let drugs transit, but suddenly it became a business of the state. Yeah. Uh, to, and that's a problem, no? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the presidential election, Pedro, the political opposition says that its candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, won by an overwhelming margin, you know, more than two to one, more than 66% of the vote. However, the Maduro government says that Maduro won with, I think, 54, 55% of the vote. What do we actually know? What we know is that an electronic system a voting system that's electronic, that the government keeps saying it's the best system in the world, it's the best system in the world, we have the best system, it's the most efficient system, suddenly has been able to generate any numbers that they can show to back their numbers. What the opposition has done with that system is that it's taking the tally that each machine generates before it transmits the results to the center, uh, to the central um, uh, headquarters of the Electoral Council, the machine generates a report, and any witness who is there can ask for a copy of this. The opposition set up in the 30,000 uh, voting uh, centers an organization to collect this um, this uh, tallies, and a very sophisticated system to you know go to a central place, scan them, transmit them to their opposition's own center, um, and then keep the original. So what, but when the government announced its result, which had Maduro winning by um, 51%, the opposition would be able to show a result with a high, high number of these tallies at hand, 73% at that moment, the first time they made the announcement, that gave a result which the opposition uh, candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, was winning by 70 to 30. So the issue is that one... You know, the opposition has been able, and they put all of these tallies on the web. You could you could punch in your voting center and see that tally, uh, copy mm. stack tally of what happens with its hash value, which is QR code with all the elements of security that supposedly make the system the most secure in the world. The government keeps insisting and increasing the number of votes that they get, um, confirming that Maduro won without showing anything. So every mm. Every deadline that they had to do it, they've missed it. And the reason is very simple. They stole this election absolutely unbashfully. They realized they couldn't win it. There were disagreements within the regime of how to stop the election and the consequences of stopping the election. And when they realized 
that the, the, the people were going out in mass voting and that it's very likely the result was going to match what all the polls were saying, they just simply went ahead and stole the election. No tallies, no numbers, no backup. Yeah. Just so our listeners understand, Pedro, Edmundo Gonzalez, while the opposition candidate is not the opposition leader, explain that to us. Well, this is part of the unique thing. We ended up with an election being stolen. But when you look at the election in the entire process, it was fraudulent almost from day one. It, you know, an election is much more than voting and counting the vote. Right. It's right. literally the conditions under which people can participate, uh, the fairness with Jake and the British aid, the access to media, the access to funding, all those things. And this has always been absolutely lopsided. What is commendable about what the opposition did this time is that instead of, you know, bitching and moaning about the conditions, they said, let's organize to win this election despite all of this this balance. So the fundamental thing is that the opposition decided, as they've done in the past, I mean, people say that the opposition doesn't get united, and the opposition actually won the National Assembly by two-thirds in 2015 because they were united. So the opposition actually does a pretty good job when, when the vote comes to get united. Sometimes they, get, they fight a lot between votes, but in this time, they said, okay, let's pick a candidate through a primary process. They went through a primary process that the government tried to affect all kinds of ways, um, and in almost an artisan primary process, almost you know very grassroots process, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a a very consistent and coherent woman who has been fighting against uh, Chavismo since the beginning um, won by whopping ninety three percent. That was a surprise to her, a surprise to all the other candidates. A surprise to the United States government, and we can talk about that, and a surprise for the regime who had always underestimated her ability to connect to the people because they always saw her as too firm, let's call it radical, and coming from a very um, upper class stratus in society. And they believed that she could not connect to the people. The mm. biggest surprise for the government of those primaries was to realize how in the poor neighborhoods where Chavismo had, people had voted in very, very high numbers in this opposition primary. Now, pay attention. When you stand in a line, you're already saying that you're in the opposition. So in a, in a situation where if you are against Maduro, you don't get the few little droppings that the government gives to the people, uh, people were willing to stand in a line that just by standing in line, you are identifying yourself as an, as, a, as, as an opposition or at least favoring the opposition. When she won the government decided to confirm the fact that she was banned for running for public office for 15 years under completely illegal procedures and with sham charges. So immediately I said, this woman cannot run. She won, but she cannot run. Then the problem is who, you know, everybody recognized that she was a leader and said, who will run? She picked right. another woman and she was also not allowed to run. And then at the last minute, she chose a former diplomat who had played a role, a supporting role in the opposition, helping politicians on kind of foreign relation issues, a very light, very well-respected guy with zero political profile. The minute she chose Edmundo Gonzalez, 70, the 74-year-old man, immediately, almost like a miracle happened, she transferred her entire popularity to him. I've never seen, and I think most observers have never seen, an instant transfer of popularity from one person to the other. It was a perception of the was, this guy is doing, you know, doing you know, God's job here by holding, being the standard bearer, but we know we're voting for Maria Corina. And the campaign that they run as a, as a, as, as a pair was an amazing campaign. And you could see as the campaign was evolving that the crowds were growing and that the people who are at the streets were people who would have voted for Maduro, who in the past voted for Chavez, who are now out there enthusiastic saying, this, this are the people that I can trust. This is a decent man behind whom is a very strong woman who will be able to change our circumstances and allow us to remain in the country and not join the 7 million people who have basically solved their problems by leaving the country. 
And that's the people who have left is one third of the population. So one of the big things that stuck in the messaging of both the decency of, of, um, of Edmundo and the firmness and consistency of, of Maria Corina is that the main promise they made is we're going to change things so that you can reunite your family here and not mm. reunite with your family in some city in the United States or in Chile or in Spain or in Australia or in any of the other 90 cities in the world that now you know, hold large Venezuelan communities. So while the opposition you know, did so well with the voters for, for that reason, what was Maduro thinking in so blatantly stealing the election? Look, I, I believe that they had a plan. I mean, I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that they thought they could create a circumstance prior to the election to suspend the election once they realized they had completely miscalculated and made a series of mistakes, just self goals, one after the other. So, I mean, I would say you could also lose the game by self goals. And I think they lost. I mean, I don't want to deny credit for the opposition that scored a lot of goals, but, but, but Maduro scored a lot of self goals. And so the tally as he hit it was very, very against him. Um, and I think they failed to find a mechanism. And I think their backup mechanism was probably a more sophisticated hacking of the election. Mm. And my sense is that that failed. And when they realized that they could not pull that, they just simply pulled numbers out, out of a drawer. They literally, the, the president of the National Committee, who, by the way, and this is kind of important when I was talking about a fraudulent event, the president of the Electoral Council is an activist of the government party and used to be the controller general who was the one who banned Maria Corina Machado from being a candidate. Then he morphs into the president of the Electoral Council. Despite all these things, again, the opposition decided to go forward, organize rally, create this army of volunteers collecting this tally so that you could actually prove, no matter what happened in the transmission of the vote, that with the tally in hand, you could prove what was a vote in the machine before the machine was connected to the internet to transfer the, that tally. So my sense is that they thought they could pull something off. They couldn't do it. And then he does it. Now, what he did looks rash, looks stupid, okay? And to some degree, it's reckless. But yeah. he had two, two options, Michael. He either accepted that the announcement of the result, the real result was made, 70-30. And that was the end of his regime. There's no long transition. That the celebration, what would have happened immediately upon that result would have probably forced him to flee the country. Okay? So it's almost like taking a cyanide pill. Yeah. Or he just decided to just take a couple spoonfuls of rat poison, uh, which has a delayed reaction, which might not have an antidote, and that's what we're dealing with right now. But he actually won time. So from his perspective, from the options he had, stealing the election was not illogical. It was probably the only thing he had to do. And then figure out, hour by hour, day to day, how to finagle it. And that's what he's doing right now. Yeah. So, Pedro, there's, there's pressure on Maduro to recognize the will of the voters. There's pressure domestically through large protests that continue and pressure diplomatically with a number of countries, including the U.S., recognizing the opposition as the winner and calling for an orderly transition. So what's going to determine how this gets resolved? Well, I think we touched at the beginning something that's critical that we spend a little bit of time on. If we agree that we're dealing with a mafia state, and that information is not a, you know, that's, this is not a political science term. This is a law enforcement term, and it's backed by incredible amount of evidence. Now, who has that evidence? On the law enforcement side, the US, Canada, Spain, the UK, France, Colombia, and others 
have had to deal with kind of the, the criminal side of this, okay? The traces, the money laundering, the, the cocaine cargoes, and, all that. and there's tons of evidence. In the U.S., there are a very large amount of sealed indictments that involve the senior civilian and military leadership of Venezuela. Who else has it? The intelligence community of those countries you know, that have serious intelligence communities. Now, what happens? My sense is that why we're in this problem is that serious governments sit around with this evidence and this intelligence, they ponder, they discuss, they go back and forth, and they choose to ignore it. So they go back again, they choose, and, and, and for years, we've been asking, uh, you know, the solution, we have to find a political solution, a negotiated solution. But one of the things that actually never happens is that you negotiate in law enforcement. And if you do, for example, in a case of, that I could use as a metaphor, where you have a, you know, a hijacking, okay? And so we could say here, this mafia state has hijacked an entire country. What you do not do is put the hostages to negotiate with the hijackers, okay? And that's the cruelty of a process that was led by Norway and supported by the United States for a long time, which of course yielded no outcome. There is no way you could put hostages and hostage takers in one table to negotiate the release of the hostages. Because yeah. if there is a kidnapping, it's because somebody has a symmetric uh, nexus of force versus the others. And that's not going to reverse. There was nothing that the opposition could ever give Maduro. The only thing the opposition was asking at the negotiation table is follow the rules, follow the letter of the Constitution. We're not asking for anything other than Maduro. Go back to what the Constitution, which you guys invented, you guys forced on us, and, you know, and it's a constitution that we are accepting to be dealt with, go back through that. And, and Norway played a tremendously, tremendously uh, cruel role here for a very long time with the support of the European community and with the support of other countries saying, we want results out of a negotiation. Suddenly, the United States got involved in 2022 to negotiate directly. And this now makes sense because the kidnapper wants to negotiate with something who has what he wants, okay, which is the ability to negotiate impunity, uh, sanctions, and stuff like that, and also something that they fear, which is greater force. What the United States did is that the team that they put to negotiate was an incompetent team. And that incompetent team was sat down for two years to negotiate with a team that has run circles around every negotiation team for 20 years, until somebody in Washington realized, oh my God, we had a staffing problem here. We, and the result is that the United States came out looking quite stupid because everything that they negotiated is now turned into this farcical election. In fact, they, they offered immediate sanction relief to Maduro's government in return for a promise to have free and fair elections. That's like that's like offering a toddler a piece of candy today in exchange for a promise to be good tomorrow. That's exactly, I mean, the one critical thing that Maduro wanted in terms of sanctions relief and have the $50 million bounty removed from his head, you know, the one he wanted was a return from one of his, um, his front men, a guy who had run basically all his sanction evasion strategy, one of the biggest corruption circles, a guy called Alex Saab, who was had been operating out of Moscow uh, in an office that had been set up by Putin, where Putin's buddies from St. Petersburg also run Russia's own sanction evasion uh, strategy. And this guy, as he was flying uh, his plane stop in Cape Verde, he was arrested, taken back to the United States. It was a waiting trial. And in exchange, exactly, essentially for nothing, um, the Biden administration gave him full clemency. Full clemency. Okay. Uh, in exchange for nothing related to Venezuela. This actually is another one of the problems now in light of this large Russian exchanges, is that when the United States goes into a negotiation with multiple objectives, okay, releasing Americans that are held hostages, uh, assuring access to, to oil, uh, looking for democracy uh, or human rights uh, improvements, sometimes you get very cross-legged. And I think the case of Venezuela mm. has to be studied as one of the most 
clumsy efforts by the U.S. administration. Uh, I mean, it goes back to the Iran-Contra days, uh, but it's incredibly clumsy. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is the administration having to deal with the results of mistakes that a lot of us warned them they were making. We are talking to Pedro Borelli about Venezuela, and we'll be right back after a short break. Beacon Global Strategies is the premier national security advisory firm. Beacon works side by side with leading companies to help them understand national security policy, geopolitical risk, global technology policy, and federal procurement trends. Beacon's insight gives business leaders the decision advantage. Founded in 2013, Beacon develops and supports the execution of bespoke strategies to mitigate business risk, drive growth, and navigate a complex geopolitical environment. With a bipartisan team and decades of experience, Beacon provides a global perspective to help clients tackle their toughest challenges. And and Pedro, are you arguing that the failed policies of all the countries you talked about, including the United States, um, contributed to what Maduro did with this election? Well, look, I, I think the fundamental issue is that if if you have a patient with multi-systems and multi-problem symptoms, um, and I would say that's the case of Venezuela, it's, it's, it's a multi-dimensional crisis. The hardest part of the crisis needs you know, specialists. I mean, you have a patient that has a brain tumor, you need an oncologist and a brain surgeon and stuff like that. That's hard, okay? So I think the feeling of the United States and other people in the international community, and I'm talking about diplomats, and politicians is to find that easier solution. Let's actually find, let's do, you know, the knee is also bad, let's do a knee replacement. Or, you know, there's a, you know, the, the, there's a problem here, you know, it's, it's a kidney issue, let's deal with that, or it's got cataracts. But the real, real problem, the one that we're talking about, which is at the heart of the problem, which is this is a mafia state, really scares, you know, foreign service officers and civil service officers, and they actually are very happy at collectively inventing a country that is not the true country, that's just a misrepresentation of a country. And many times, as I talk to governments about Venezuela, I actually find myself talking to people about a country that I don't recognize. Now, mm -hmm. when I do that to a smaller country in Latin America, to a small European country, I don't mind. But when I sit in Washington talking to people who have more information that I have access to, about what's happening in my country. And they start trying to talk to me about something that I do not recognize as being the real problem. That's where we have a problem. Because the fact is that if there is no easy solution for political problems, for deep ingrained political problems, because if you take them to the UN Security Council, you know, for sure, in the case of Venezuela, you're gonna have the veto. And we've had it. I mean, the Trump administration tried time and time again to take this to the UN Security Council only to get a veto from Russia and China. So that doesn't work. You got that regional bodies, and in Venezuela, in Latin America, or in the Americas, we have the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which when it was passed, literally on 9-11, on the actual day of 9-11, Colin Powell was in Lima signing that Inter-American Democratic Charter, which everybody celebrated as literally the best document that called for collective action when democracy was in danger. That has not worked over all these years in which Venezuela's democracy has been crumbling. So if that doesn't work, imagine a law enforcement mechanism. If we define this as law uh, purely a law enforcement challenge, this yeah. is a bunch of thugs that have taken over a country. Now, what is the solution? Now, the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that we should just divert the attention and try to solve a problem which is not the main problem. The fact that it's difficult, if we all agree that this is a problem, might actually lead to a serious conversation about how to solve it. But if we're running away from the diagnostic, if we're running away from the real problem, we're never going to find a solution. So, so it sounds, Pedro, like, and this is important, I think, it sounds like you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you're saying the key to getting to the right place today after the election is the international community coming together and challenging the regime 
on the basis of its criminal activity and putting into the public domain all of the information they have that demonstrates that, including unsealing the indictments. I, I believe it's so, and I think the reason that was not done before is, well, there's always a prosecutorial seal in the case of the United States. No, we're, we're still investigating in the cases. We don't want to damage it. We don't want to unseal it. That's part of it. But I also think there is a reluctance of having to show the problem in a manner that makes it difficult to solve, okay? And bureaucrats tend to just want to kick the, kick, kick the can just down. And if you actually have to face starkly at this, and I'll, I'll use this example, Michael, it's, it's very important. Another of the issues in the negotiation that was important for Maduro's side when negotiating with this hapless team of American bureaucrats was we want, there cannot be a free, fair election if Maduro, who's running for re-election, has a $15 million bounty on his head. So please take it away. And with all the things that the Biden administration gave away for nothing, that was one thing that they did not give up. And you could say that it's somewhat cowboyish to put a $50 million price tag, you know, $50 million for information about this guy where everybody knows where the guy is and once in a while he gets on planes and travels. It was a symbol that the Biden administration, although they probably didn't like it there, were reluctant to take away. Yeah. And when I confronted somebody at the administration and said, you never took that away, he says, yes, we didn't take took, took it away because in reality, the bounty should not be 15, should be $50 million. So when you're sitting and you honestly, in earnest, and, I, I, and I'm 100% sure that President Biden and the team know who they're dealing with, but they thought they could get away inventing a country and a crisis that had a different nature and that could throw the responsibility to the people of Venezuela. You go on the streets and solve it. It is a crisis that's made by Venezuelans, but it's a crisis that's affecting the entire region. Through immigration now, it's affecting the United States through the entry into the United States of criminal gangs that have been actually being pushed out of Venezuela in order to create chaos from Argentina to Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, all the way to Central America, into the United States, it is a problem. When Maduro gets supported by stealing the election without any number, and immediately Putin comes in and says, well, that's great, we want you now to join the BRICS, and China comes right in, we've got a bigger problem here, okay? Venezuela, I am 100% sure, is not important for Russia or China. It's only important to the extent that they can needle the United States in its own hemisphere. They can be troublemakers in the hemisphere. They do not care about democracy. They don't care about stability. They don't care about migration in this region. They, anything that they do to get back at the United States, they're going to do. So this is what makes this a complicated crisis, not just one that Venezuelans can solve. But having said that, what the Venezuelans did in, on Sunday, the turnout, how they voted against all kinds of potential retribution, okay, the leadership that they had, what Maracurina Machado and Edmundo have done, the risk that they're taking, there's not much more that a society can do under the terms of a democracy. Can we go out on the streets? Yes. Should we be asked all the time, oh, we now need to see protests. No, you saw votes. You got people voting. People have gone out and protesting and people are getting killed. People are getting randomly killed by thugs because when you have a cartel, the cartel doesn't send the army to kill. The cartel sends its soldiers to kill. Okay. It is those thugs that are killing people randomly in the street just to make sure that people don't go on the street. So unless we understand the nature of the problem, what is the, at the origin of the problem, and it's not understanding it, it's simply focusing on the intelligence in which billions of dollars have been invested in total of looking at how transnational crime networks are working, how they're using Venezuela as a production source for cocaine, because it's much easier to produce cocaine if the state is your partner than if you're doing it, trying, trying to make sure that the state doesn't find you, okay? You could do it in a greater scale with more technology, and that's what Venezuela has become, a hub of production of the best quality cocaine and other narcotics in the world. Now, I don't have to tell this to the United States government. I don't have to tell this to the UK government. I don't have to tell this to the Spanish government. They know it. Yeah. 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 So, Pedro, um, 
very importantly, you talked about why this matters to the U.S., which I think the media had and and our own government here has done a poor job of articulating. So could you go through it one more time? Why does this matter to my listeners? Why does this matter to the American public broadly? Why should we care? Well, first of all, you always want to live in a neighborhood that functions, that works. It's a good neighborhood, a neighborhood that buys things or sells things to you that you want to buy or sell. Okay, that's a, the fundamental yep. thing. Yep. If the neighborhood becomes to be insecure, violent, or basically the property of people who have very different views than what you have, suddenly it begins to impinge on you. I would say, and I continue to state, that while the United States is focused on th in three critical areas, which is obviously Russia, Ukraine, China, the South China Sea, Straits of Taiwan, and the Middle East, Mexico, and by Mexico, I simply saw its southern border, that it's being penetrated by anybody who wants to go through it. And it's being used by anybody who can enter any country in Latin America and then use that passage to go in. That is the biggest risk that the United States has because it's actually right there and it's not controlled. Right. All the efforts that were done after 9-11 to understand who's coming in and out and what they're bringing into the United States, all that power, all that computing power, all those magnificent technologies that have been put together in order to have TSA identify anybody, that is all gone away. Now, yeah. if you got enemies of the United States who know that and have bases in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Venezuela, because they're there and they have, they, their foothold grows, you're going to have a real big problem that the United States had never considered, which is a problem right there in your border. Not, I'm not talking about a migration problem. I'm talking of a national security problem. I'm right. talking about your enemies meddling at your border in big amounts. And that is happening. Okay? One. Two. I don't think oil is a matter. I think one of the things that was most deceiving about the way the White House changed completely its course in Venezuela in 1922, uh, in, in 2022, sorry, was when they said, oh, we're going to, you know, because of the war in Ukraine, uh, we're going to go to talk to Venezuela because they, they increased their production. And literally, literally, the way the White House leaked the information that they're sending a mission to talk to somebody who they did not recognize as the president of Venezuela was, we're going to separate Maduro from Putin. How did that one work? Yeah. Okay? That didn't work that well. So again, yeah. understanding much better that once Russia and China understood that the United States does not believe in a multipolar world in the way that they view it, okay? Because in the way that they view multipolarities, there are multiple poles, and each pole has an area of influence that the other one cannot meddle in. Right. So multipolarity, the idea is that there's no unipower. That's great. I mean, that's superb, Okay. Um, the idea is that we should respect that China can control a piece of the territory miles away from its borders and that Russia has access to what they used to consider their, the Soviet Union. That's an absurdity. But to the extent that the United States is meddling, okay, or they would, much more than meddling, assisting Ukraine in holding back Russia, uh, or that they're meddling and creating and aligning themselves in the, in, 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 in the Pacific to contain China, they're saying, well, Latin America is free game. Yeah. Okay, let's play hardball in Latin America. And the problem is that Latin America, in the mind of people, is what used to be something like Senator Luger used to say, no terrorists, no nukes, no problems. But welcome to the Latin America of the 21st century. Yeah. There's lots of very basic problems. It's fentanyl, it's other drugs, it's terrorism. And it's the enemies at the border. Yeah. Um, Pedro, I want to ask you two more questions in the last few minutes that we have. The first is, um, if this gets resolved in, in the right way and the opposition takes power in Venezuela, the, the job facing them would be massive. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, look, this is an oil country um, where the oil sector, the oil... The, the state oil company was the goose that laid the golden egg. And that goose is long buried. 
long gone, destroyed. It does not exist. The reserves are there, okay? Obviously, the reserves don't go. They're very heavy oil. They're, you know, in, in the time that you get to develop it, people might not want to deal with reserves that are so heavy. So we basically have a, a, a resource that's going to stay buried there. But Venezuela has lots of other resources. Venezuela has more water. I mean, Venezuela has water that allows it to basically, you know, if everything were operating right, all of our electricity could come from hydro. At some points in the past, on some, some days, that actually was the case. That's quite unique that having all of the oil in the world, you also have all of the water in the world, and the water being a, a critical resource. It's incredibly well located, okay? And I think what people have learned, and I, I'm, I'm going to take something, it's a very unique view, is we've lost 8 million people. In a very short period of time, we lost one-third of people. Among those, we've lost you know, all kinds of things. Okay, and by the way, these are Chavistas, not Chavistas, everybody's left. But a lot of our young educated have left. Mm. If we could only get a 10% of those who not only were well-educated in the best university in Venezuela, but now have had work experience and life experience outside, if 10% of those people returned, I think the speed, the acceleration, the ideas, the innovation which Venezuela could tackle these challenges, it's superb. So the flip side, the flip side of a massive exodus is the benefit of a small return. Okay? Mm -hmm. The problem is that I think that once we get rid of the upper echelon, the nomenclatura of Maduro's regime, we're actually going to find and have to deal with this criminal infrastructure that's going to try to, to prevail. And we are going to see something that we've seen in Mexico, we've seen in Colombia, now we've seen in Ecuador, which is really what are the cartels willing to do to hold on to right. their territory, to their business, and to actually increase the territory they control and increase their business. My sense, Michael, is because people tend to confuse the narcotics business, which is somewhat invisible. You don't see trucks or, or buildings that have signs that said, you know, narcotics incorporated or anything like that, with counter-narcotics, which is very visible because you arrest people, you, you, you're, you, you, you find, you know, stashes of, of drugs, uh, you have killings of journalists, you have killings of judges, you have killings of drug guys. You see none of that in Venezuela. But the reason you don't see it is not because the business doesn't exist, it's because the state is a right. cartel. Right. So there is no right. counter-narcotics. Right. The right. moment a serious government comes in, and has to take control of the country, of its territory, and, and introduce elements of anti-narcotics, I think we're going to be in for a very big shock. And that is Maduro's legacy. I think it's important to know that you not only do that as a son of Venezuela, but you do it as a U.S. citizen. Yes. Um, I do it. <laughs> well, I would say I do it as a Venezuelan. Uh, who happened to be have been living in the United States when this crisis began. I, as a Venezuelan, I did something that was unusual. I tried to make sure that this was always bipartisan. Uh, you know, I, as a Venezuelan, I wasn't going to take sides of the political divide in the United States because I always believed that what was going on in Venezuela mattered to both uh, Democrats and yes. Republicans. Yes. There are basic core issues that I think there's no disagreement between the parties. And that, to some extent, or to most extent, was the case. I think Venezuela, if you saw when interim President Guaido came to the State of the Union in 1920, sorry, 2020, uh, it was the only standing ovation that President Trump got is when he said, here's President Guaido. Everybody stood, and there were two very, very, very big standing ovations to the fight the Venezuelans were given for democracy. So this has always stayed that way. Um, and it should stay that way. It's very dangerous, yes. the background. Now, what began to happen, though, is after many, many years of living in the United States, I suddenly realized that in order to get deeper involved in the discussion, I, I wanted to feel more comfortable. And I had the right, having lived for a long time, to claim my American citizenship, and I did. And that actually changed, because once you look at this also as an American, I actually now believe that my country of choice has made decisions that are doing tremendous damage to my country of birth. Um, and I don't know why this is happening. I believe that right now, as we're speaking, the administration understands the mistakes that they were made. It took them a very, very long time 
I would particularly say that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and the Secretary of State have been careless. Okay, staffing does matter. Okay, you cannot take a long time to replace people who are doing a bad job. Okay, once you focus attention, they were completely careless. They could say probably we had other bigger fish to fry, but in reality, we are this problem that we have no idea how to resolve, and it could get very, very violent because the system looked the other side and left this in the hands of a very, very incompetent director for Western Hemispheres at the National Security Council and a below par assistant secretary for Western Hemisphere at the State Department. And like I said, as I used to say in the Reagan administration, policy is personnel. Yep. This is a critical case yep. in which that has been proven true. Yeah. Pedro, on that sobering note, I'm going to say thank you for joining us um, to discuss this incredibly important issue. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for shining some attention into this and your fine program. That was Pedro Borelli. I'm Michael Morell. Please join us next week for another episode of Intelligence Matters. Intelligence Matters is produced by Steve Dorsey with assistance from Ashley Berry and Sophia Rubin. Intelligence Matters is a production of Beacon Global Strategies.